Hi everyone, I'm Sophia. And I'm Stefan. And for the past year, we've been working away on the release of ASP.NET Core that you saw throughout the conference. Now, as John mentioned, in this session, we want to take you through some of the features that we released that might not have been highlighted in other sessions. And with that, Stefan, do you want to show us what's new in SignalR? Absolutely. If you go to my screen, you'll see that we put together a solution with a bunch of demo projects showing uh, the underlying features in ASP.NET that might not have gotten as much attention in this uh, conference so far. And one that I'm most excited to show you, um, and the reason we're starting with this, is a little bit complicated demo, but we have something called SignalR Stateful Reconnect. In the past, we called the Seamless Reconnect. The idea here is even when your underlying WebSocket long polling connection dies, the server and the client can both hold on to their most recently sent messages. And if they reconnect, they can replay messages without any events. And things should continue um, without having to like go to a database or have like this long reconnecting. Um, so two things that you need to really know to enable this is that unlike reconnects that you might have used previously. This does need to be enabled on the server. This is because this takes extra memory for each single R connection that there is potentially. Um, every single message that is unacknowledged will end up being buffered. Uh, and that is what allows this feature to work. So we allow stateful reconnects on the server. You might notice some extra things like the default client timeout's 30 seconds. I changed it to five minutes because I don't want to be racing. This <laughs> demo is a little bit difficult. Um, but with Automatic Reconnect, I think was introduced in .NET Core 3.1-ish. Uh, with Stateful Reconnect is way easier than it, when it works. So if you call with Stateful Reconnect, um, you can see this behavior. So I have your classic programmer UI SignalR chat app. I didn't even bother removing the bullet points from the unordered list for the chat. And uh, Safia. That's her GitHub username right here, and myself, Halter73, are chatting. And I'm curious if she wants lunch. But unfortunately, as soon as I sent that message, I go offline. And then, Safia, I'll, I'll type for you. you. You down for lunch? Yeah. Um, sure. Now? Well, I didn't get that over here. I'm offline. You there? That's the acronym for what, it, what for those of you who are curious. Now, if I just were to go and enable, uh, you know, the internet again, the web socket would continue working. So I add a little bit of extra logic to the server so I can reset my most recent web socket. But when we come back online, what you'll see is that we'll get this new connection. So that popped up this new web socket connection in the network tab, and then all these messages go through. One thing you'll notice is that there weren't any reconnect events. Um, so when we reconnect, the client here is sending what's known as a sequence message, which tells the server the um, message that it's resending. So while I was disconnected, I sent that you there. So that gets resent. And then all of Safia's messages that didn't come over the old connection now come over the new one. And to quickly show the difference uh, between stateful reconnects and normal reconnects is if we were to do the same thing, we'll, we'll just focus on uh, resetting my connection instead of both. But let's say that we disconnect like we did before, reset the connection again. And you'll see that now we get an error. Um, and eventually, it will reconnect again. But you'll see that Sophius now sees I've left the chat. Anything that was sent in the meantime won't be received. So I'll be reconnected. I'll have a new connection ID. I can be the same user if I'm authenticated. Um, but so another thing to point out is you can enable them both together. So stateful reconnect is going to be what we try first. And if that fails, um, we'll go back to the reconnect. You, knew before. But to support both of those, looking back at that client code, you do need to call both with automatic reconnect and with stateful reconnect. And I'm pretty happy getting that done without many demo fails. <laughs> um, Safia, I've heard that there's some cool stuff going on in minimal APIs. Yes, absolutely. 
So if you've used Biddable APIs in .NET 7 and before, you might be familiar with the fact that form binding support in minimal APIs is rather limited. Um, one thing that we did in .NET 8 is added support for enhanced form binding in minimal APIs. Um, to show you what this looks like, I'm going to hop over to my web browser here, where I have got a simple application that showcases a form. Um, this form is designed to allow us to submit information related to a to-do. So I've got um, a to-do name, a due date, and the status of my to-do. I've gone ahead and filled out some details for this form. Um, get a give my .NET Conf presentation, and this is due at least by the end of the week. And I'm going to go ahead and click Submit. And what we'll see is that we have received a response back from the server with the contents of the form that we just uploaded. Um, let's take a look at the server code to see what just happened here. OK, cool. Now, if we look at the back end for my application here, we'll see that I've got a minimal API. And I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. Um, first is lines 12 through 71, where I've truncated some of the code related to rendering that HTML form that you saw. Most interesting, though, is line 73, which is the endpoint that actually processes that form response. It's super terse. The key point here is this from form explicit attribute on my to-do parameter. This is an indicator to minimal API's parameter binding logic that we want to resolve the to-do parameter from the form body. And interestingly enough, I get it resolved, and I'm able to access all of the elements um, in my response. There's something else going on here, too, in addition to just being able to support complex form binding that we weren't able to do before, which is related to some of the other components that are sent with my request. So if we take a look at the request here, we'll see that I'm sending over some anti-forgery cookies. OK, that's kind of interesting. Um, and we'll also spot that I am sending um, a anti-forgery verification token as part of the form data payload. What happens with all of this stuff? Well, that is also new in .NET 8, and that is support for the new anti-forgery middleware. Now, in .NET 7 and prior to, anti-forgery val token validation was only supported via an MVC authorization filter. If you wanted to do anti-forgery token validation in minimal APIs or another layer, you have to roll that out yourself. No longer the case in Donna 8. We've shipped a new anti-forgery middleware that you can enable with the use anti-forgery method that lights up in your application. And what's really cool about this is that it functions across all of the framework implementations in ASP.NET Core. So minimal APIs, MVC, and Blazor all respect the anti-forgery middleware's um, features and state. So the anti-forgery middleware is not the only middleware that is new in Donna 8. We've been doing a ton of work to introduce new middlewares. And, and Stefan, I think you have a few to show us. Yeah, I absolutely do. And to start off, I'm excited to show the request timeout middleware. And hold, you know, there's a lot of code here. I'll try to go through it pretty slowly. But this is what's known as an endpoint aware middleware. So say like your authorization middleware, where you can put on authorized attributes and stuff on various endpoints. Um, with request timeouts, we have the ability to have different timeouts for different endpoints. So much like auth, you have the ability to define a policy. This policy writes a response saying that you know it timed out the request. That doesn't happen by default. Normally, it just writes a 504 gateway timeout. Normally, a 504 is the server's fault, and a 408 is the client's fault. And uh, even though this demo is only timing out because of task.delays, I'm a good programmer. So if it timed out, it's probably the client. Um, so we're going to change the uh, this uh, for the right timeout response. Now, you can still use the request timeouts middleware if you're not using endpoints. Um, you can define a default policy that will apply to any endpoint that doesn't have a more specific policy or um, that doesn't have the disable um, request timeout. So in .NET 7, we introduced a new feature to um, the route builder called map groups. So for most of these tests, we're using this policy, the right timeout response, that I defined right here. So we have the default policy. We'll take a look at delay async in a second. It, it calls task.delay. Um, but I do want to point out that like, if you do write a response after the cancellation, um, the default 
write timeout response won't get called. Um, and if you have a more specific timeout, maybe you called with request timeout with a time span, or maybe you use that request timeout attribute that I pointed to earlier, that will override the policy entirely. And there's the disable request timeout metadata I talked about before and the middleware. So without further ado, um, we are going to start this demo. You'll notice that I started this without debugging. That's important. You will not see a timeout if you do a uh, debug. That happened to me in the prep. And then on this page, I have some JavaScript that's hitting all those endpoints that I showed you. And you can see what happened. So um, the, the default policy, we configure that to be a 408. Um, three second timeout wrote that custom response. Um, if you set a um, delay that is less than the three second timeout, there, there will be no timeout. Um, the custom response is written instead of that right timeout response here. Um, if you set the two second time spans, you see the two second timeouts, but then you don't have the other things that you set for your default policy. If you disable things, you get no timeouts. And then the middleware, if you delay long enough, remember our global policy, our default policy was seven seconds. So it timed out after seven seconds after we said the delay should be 10. Um, for what it's worth, this is defaulting to five seconds for every delay. Um, another thing worth noting is this timeout is cooperative. So in this, we're passing in this request aborted token. If you take a cancellation token and say like an MVC controller or a minimal API, that's normally tied to the request. So if the client, the browser, cancels the request, this cancellation token will be aborted. But when you add this request timeout middleware with use request timeouts and set the correct policy configuration, it will create a link cancellation token source that will timeout whichever happens first, um, the delay um, or the configured timeout or the client cancels the request. And to just quickly demonstrate that, if we do pass in cancellation token.none to this uh, delay, um, which would be probably better to do here, so it affects everything for the most part, and then run this again, you'll see that there are no timeouts. And not just because I'm debugging, I'll let you trust me on that because we got a lot of demos. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to start the debugger, I just warned you. But as much as uh, middle, uh, you know, ASP net developers write middleware and endpoints, they also do a lot with DI. And I know we have some exciting new DI features. Yes, you are totally right. Um, ASP.NET Core developers interact a lot with the DI container, if not more than they do with middleware. Um, and we're excited to introduce a new feature to the built-in DI container um, in ASP.NET Core for Donna 8, support for keyed services. Now, services are typically identified by their service type, something like an iStorage provider. Keyed services are uniquely identified by their type and a service key, which allows us to distinguish between different implementations of the same service type. So to take us through an example, I've got a demo here that showcases a sample application where I have an iStorage provider interface that I've implemented twice, one with a local storage provider and again with an Azure storage provider. I'm leveraging new APIs in the runtime to add keyed services for the local storage provider and the Azure storage provider to my application with the local and Azure key keys to identify them. This is using the add keyed singleton method. Now, what's really interesting here is that we have brought in support for keyed services into the ASP.NET Core frameworks. So I'm talking about minimal APIs, MVC, Blazor and SignalR. And to do that, you're going to want to take advantage of the new from keyed services attribute. I'm doing that right here in my two minimal endpoints, resolving one, um, resolving the local storage provider for one and the Azure storage provider for the other. And if I go ahead and send a request to my running application to both of these endpoints, I can see that one service is resolved as the local storage provider service, and the other is resolved as the Azure storage provider. It's really important as I was able to leverage key services to distinguish between the two, instead of having to juggle around concrete implementations. So that's pretty nifty. Support for key services, including the integration that comes to minimal APIs binding layer. Now, 
Minimal API's binding layer has a ton of rules and functionality. It's a little bit magical, we like to say sometimes. And one of the things that I think was really great that we did in .NET 8 was introduce new analyzers to help you use Minimal API's implicit binding rules more effectively. So let's go ahead and show you some of these analyzers now. I've got another sample application where I've kind of misused some of our APIs and, and parameter binding rules, and I want to show you what these analyzers will help you do. So first, I've got line 14 in my code here. I'm implementing a post-processing handler that accepts a request at a route that seems to have a to-do route parameter. I'm highlighting that right here. And it resolves that using into a to-do parameter type. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that I'm immediately alerted about something that I'm doing wrong here, which is that the parameter to do that I'm referencing, which is mapped to the to do parameter in the route, um, does not define a try parse method or implement the iParsable interface. I'm doing something wrong here. I'm saying that something should be resolved from the route, but I haven't really presented a way to parse it from that route value. And the analyzer is telling me that I probably need to fix this. There's a couple of different solutions to this. I might change the type of the parameter that I'm consuming so that it actually does contain a try parse method or implements iParsable. I might implement a try parse method on that type. Or because I'm in the middle of a demo, I might just go ahead and delete the route pattern. In which case, we're going to assume that that to do parameter needs to be resolved from the JSON body of the request and not from the route. So pretty neat. That was kind of a helpful guide into properly letting me know how to use um, minimal API's parameter binding effectively. There's another mistake in my code, though. I've got another API on line 17. And what I'm being alerted to here is the fact that my handler contains two distinct parameters that both contain the from body attribute. The from body attribute lets me know that these parameters need to be resolved from the JSON body of the request but it's not possible to materialize the same JSON body in two different ways in my route handler. So the analyzer is telling me that this is incorrect. I need to fix it. There's a couple of different ways that I can do this. I know that that second parameter, I to do service, should be coming from the DI container in my application. So I can replace from body with from services to let minimal API know that that's where I want to source it. Or I can just go ahead and remove that attribute altogether in which case, minimal API's implicit binding magic will determine that I to do service exists in my DI container. So it should come from there and not from the JSON body. Now, what I love about the analyzers that we've been shipping in .NET 8 is this is a space where we've had a ton of community engagement come in. Um, we've had quite a few PRs come in from members of the community contributing new analyzers to ASP.NET Core. And I want to highlight one of those right now, um, giving a shout out to David Acker, who contributed this analyzer to the ASP.NET Core code base. Now, mind you, it's not just an analyzer. It's also a code fixer. So we're actually going to be able to um, use code fixers to make the update to comply with the analyzer's warnings here and not have to type any code at all, which is pretty neat. So what's this new analyzer about? Here it is up on line 7. I'm calling the add authorization API to register add authorization related services um, into my application. And I'm also configuring a custom authorization policy. Now, in .NET 7, we introduced a new API, Add Authorization Builder, that allowed you to register authorization services and configure policies with fewer lines of code, less nesting. And we'll see here that the analyzer is warning me about just that. I should probably use the Add Authorization Builder to register those services and construct the policies. So I'm going to go ahead and apply the quick fix, hit it, and voila. My code looks just a little bit terser, nicer to read using that new API that we introduced in .NET 7. Um, I love how useful these analyzers are for helping me write much better code in my application. I could get carried away talking about so many of them. But before I do that, Stefan, you were kind of on a roll talking about middlewares. Do you have another one to show us? I've got two more. We'll start off with this new short circuit middleware. So this is what you can reach to if you have middleware that you don't want to run for specific endpoints. Um, in the past, generally, we've said, let's make your uh, middleware endpoint aware, like the request timeout middleware we just showed you. So if you don't have specific metadata on the endpoint, maybe have your middleware no op. But for certain things, um, that's not convenient. Maybe there are certain 
routes that you don't want to log uh, or that you just want to quickly um, 404 instead of you know checking the disk because you know um, for certain fold subfolders and stuff you're never going to have content there. This is what short circuit does. So let's first look at map short circuit. Its first parameter is a status code. So this is 404 not found. And then it takes a params list of route prefixes. So we'll show what that means in a second. Um, but it's not any prefix. It's a route prefix. And then we also added short circuit metadata to this normal map get endpoint that is returning a favicon. So um, and, and then we have middleware. Let's pretend this is doing something expensive that's logging every request. All right, so if we take a look at the console output, we see our, our middleware um, log the request path to uh, forward slash, but not favicon. But it's possible that you know the browser didn't you know make that request. Maybe it was cached or something. But you can see now we did, um, and still no log. Well, let's make extra sure that we're not like you know not logging any request again. We'll do favicon two, and, and it's logged. Um, so let's quickly look at what we have going on with this map sh short circuit. Um, so we have ignore prefixes. So normally you can't find a route. You're going to get a 404 anyway. Um, but if we go ignored. One second, and we go back to the log. I should have gone 50-50 with this demo. <laughs> Too late. Um, you'll see that the uh, ignored is there. Did I type it right? Um, interesting. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Oh, typos get the best of us. <laughs> That's how you know it's live. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And, and there we go. So now if we try it again, we'll see only the, the misspelled one still. Um, and then if we add things after the prefix, same deal. Um, one thing is, though, the prefix means with a forward slash. It's like routing. So if you do ignore two, um, that will show up in the log, just kind of FYI. Um, and then there's one more middleware that I'm excited to get to. We're running low on time, but um, this is a deep cut. This is why um, we save this for the end. Um, but I'm excited to get to it, that we get to show it to you. And this will be the um, new feature that we added to use exception handler. So this is a middleware that you probably used before. But what's new is this interface right here, iExceptionHandler. This is not generally intended for web application developers. Um, as you can see, use exception handler takes a parameter error uh, or string, which is like the route that you want to redirect to on an error. So here we have an error handler that takes the I exception handler feature. This also existed before dot dot eight and like tells you what exception was thrown and stuff if we go to the error endpoint. Um, but I added two. I exception handlers, which could be done by a library. Say that we have a, a library that um, maybe it's dealing with uh, with teapots, um, and anytime it throws a library exception, if the app hasn't handled it and written a response itself, um, it, it will say that I am a teapot, and then um, it will say that it's handled, which means that we won't direct to the error page. If we return false, that means you should run the normal user defined handler, and that's why the logging one always returns false. So. Really quickly, I don't have like a bunch of JavaScript to hit all the endpoints at once like with the timeout. But if we hit the error, we should still see the error page, but we should get an extra log, hopefully. Um, not error, because that is the error page. Sorry. Um, what do we call it? Invalid, I think. <laughs> Maybe I should have had the custom page. Um, are we still running? Oh, I don't think it's running. Maybe that's it. All right, I'm still running the short circuit app because yes. I did not change my startup project. Yeah. All right, so really quick, hopefully it doesn't take too long. Valid. Hurrah. You see the thing from our air handler in teapot. You don't. I'm a teapot. Exciting. Um, and we got that in just with the nick of time, but there are a lot more that we weren't able to demo.
Yes, you are totally right. I feel like we just sprinted through a marathon with all of these demos. Now, there are so many more features that are coming out in this release of ASP.NET Core. Some of them we've already covered and some are cute little details like support for generic attributes in MVC. Um, you can try all of these out by downloading .NET 8, and you can check out the code for this demo at this GitHub repo that we've got up, get things running, play around with it yourself. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we hope you enjoy .NET 8, 